John Golden Britt is an award-winning director of photography whose portfolio includes national television spots, music videos, and documentaries captured on both film and digital media. A member of the International Cinematographers Guild, Britt has seen two of his films debut at the Sundance Film Festival and has been awarded two Rocky Mountain Emmys for photography out of a total of five nominations. Since 2007, he has been an independent camera expert for Sony's XD Cam HD line of camcorders. Brett served as director of photography on two films in New Mexico for the National Park Service, Sky Island and White Sands, A Land in Motion, which was a winner in, both in Best in Government category and also received a Merit Award for Cinematography at the 2012 International Wildlife Film Festival. Recently, he has photographed a number of projects, uh, including Spike TV's Unrivaled series, Breaking Bad's final season documentary, and a film for the National Radio Observatory's Very Large Array. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to John Golden Britt with Sony. Thanks for coming. Um, thank you, Lance, for the introduction. I've got a fair amount to cover here, and I'll just go right into it. Uh, as Lance introduced me, um, you've heard a little bit about my career, primarily as a cameraman throughout these years, um, but also as an editor at KME. I was chief editor for uh, almost eight years at KME and director of photography. How's that for a job description? Um, during the transition to HD, which was, I believe, 2007, 2008, um, during that time as chief editor, I delivered 10, uh, well, over a dozen Nash, uh, shows to, uh, to PBS according to the PBS guidelines and technical operating specs. And if you've ever had a look at that book, it uh, can be daunting for an editor. There's, there's some. I'm quite proud of, uh, of that, actually, as an editor. Um, the last six years, I've been a freelance shooter, uh, non-exclusively represented by a company called Production Outfitters uh, here in, in, in Albuquerque. And just a little plug, we have the best gear and crews in the, in the uh, western United States, we'll say. This seems like the story on a lot of things, whether it's looking at my kids who grew up really fast or um, technology. And, and the, you know, it goes without saying, who, who would have ever thought that cameras would be as small and as high quality as they are now? Or that 422 50 megabits XD Cam HD would be considered a proxy. I would have never guessed that seven years ago. Um, it, would, it just, it just it, it's mind blowing. I don't do a lot of feature films. I don't do a lot of uh, television shows um, as, a, as a camera operator. Most of my work is television work. It's, it's, it's derivative work of, of the movies in, in some cases. Do a lot of EPK work. Um, as Lance mentioned, uh, I shot the fifth final season documentary, uh, which will be on the DVD for Breaking Bad, as well as the behind the scenes on Breaking Bad. And what I've noticed is in the last year, uh, Everything's changed, <laughs> as Lance keeps ta said. A lot of things are changing, and it's certainly changed in the last year, year and a half for me. It's that reality and documentary television have stratified. And in the stratification, the, uh, there's been in like an upper level of programming and some lower levels of programming. And I'm talking about cameras here and, and, and image quality. And, and at the upper levels, we're talking about um, a, um, a lot of folks want large imagers. That's, that's been at the upper levels. And I'll give you some examples. Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations, uh, The Layover. They're using uh, F3's uh, Doomsday Preppers, HBO's 24-7 series, sports series, 60 Minutes, uh, Spike TV, Unrivaled, and um, quite a few others. So we're seeing a stratification. So in the past, um, for a long time, it was beta cam. You know, I was sent out with a beta cam, an essentially rectangular device that fits on the shoulder. It's got stability. It's got balance. It's got a real viewfinder, uh, two-thirds imager, uh, walk-away media. In other words, here's the tape. It'll never be used again, most likely. It is that media. You'll never. You don't have to erase it. Uh, and a wide to long zoom, being able to change the focal length, and. That was the plan. I mean, that was the, the way it was for a long time. And now uh, we have often Super 35 imagers with all their beauty and responsibility. Lenses that are larger and more expensive, uh, limited focal lengths, and recordable media that must be archived and then repurposed. So we're into a situation where we're often dumping cards uh, and reusing them on the set. It's all changed. 
So um, what is what is 4K? I don't think I need to go through this too much. I'll just kind of click through the slides a little bit here. But let's see if it'll play. Yeah. So we started out with standard deaf television for years and years, obviously. Uh, I was there at KME during the transition to HD, and it was a little it was a little painful, I got to say, you know, because we were essentially doubling our, our our image size, and the data rates and the file size management management was quite daunting. Um, we went Sony XD Cam HD on Avid Media Composer uh, Composer Adrenaline, and it was tough at first. And even Sony and Avid did not play well, and uh, Brad can speak to that. I remember calling him at one evening and asking him, can you work tomorrow night, all night, to get this show out? My Avid is, is, is it's not playing well with Sony XD Cam, and we're going to have to finish it on Final Cut, which was, I ate a lot of crow because I, I was always kind of a PC person, and, and I just kind of used to say, and this is really nasty, that Macs were meant for children. and. <laughs> And, I, and, and that was a really snide comment, and I've, I've really had to eat a lot of crow there calling Brad up in the middle of the night. Um, but it was tough, but we got through it. We did it. We conquered HD, and we work in it every, every day now. Um, so uh, moving on up the scale here, we have what they call uh, 2K, 2048 by 10, 1080. And then moving on up the scale, we have uh, 4K Ultra HD or Quad Full HD. And it's 3840 by 2160. Uh, I, as I understand, this is primarily a presentation format. Um, you would shoot full 4K to cover this. And then we move again. And that's, excuse me, I, went, I was ahead of myself, but that's Quad Full HD right there at 3840 by 2160. Yes. And then we are at 4K at 7% more. So uh, as everyone has um, basically communicated to us throughout the morning, is this is a lot more real estate. It's a lot more to deal with. But it's a lot more possibility. It's a lot more potential. Um, and it's, it's oversampling is, is, I don't think, ne is always a bad thing. I think it can be a really good thing um, for obvious reasons. Um, improved aesthetic value and, ar and archive value as well. I just want to say that Sony has been a leader in 4K technology starting uh, in 2005 with the introduction into movie theaters of its commercial 4K projector. It's hard to believe, 2005, it seemed like so long ago. Uh, and right now there are about 15,000 theaters with Sony digital cinema 4K projectors and a lot more screens uh, with 4K projectors from even other brands. Uh, you can even watch 4K on the web now. Um, it's YouTube, Vimeo, it's there. Um, there's and Sony has this new device just came out. This is from Variety Magazine, September 4th. Um, the 4K Ultra Media Player list for $5.99. Um, it comes with 10 preloaded bonus feature films. And I keep hearing uh, rumors of Bridge uh, on the River Kwai coming out in 4K. So I can't wait for that. Um, it's, connect, it's connected to the Video Unlimited 4K network by Sony and is a built-in 2 terabyte hard drive. Just, just showing you some of the devices that are out there. So 4K in the home is, is, is slowly coming around. Um, there's 4K televisions. Uh, there have been 4K projectors and 4K televisions for the home for the last one and a half years and prices are coming down like everything. Uh, ultimately, there will be a, a huge array of 4K display and playback dev devices in our, our consumer world. Okay, so here we are, the future ahead of schedule. I just want to move ahead here. Here are our cameras um, that we're going to talk about today. Uh, we have the F55 out in the lobby. You're welcome to come by and get your hands on it. I'm, I'm, I'm much more comfortable showing it to you in that environment. And I'd, and I'd like to, to, to give you a few uh, notes about it. Uh, the F5 and the F55 easily... Um, differentiated by the, the, the black ring and the silver ring, and that's where the lens mount is. Uh, the F5 is rated at 2000 ASA. It's 2K or HD internally and 4K outside. In other words, you'd need a 4K recorder to, to record 4K with the F5. It has no global shutter, 
and its max is 180 frames per second. And it's a closer camera to the F3 in terms of its bare pattern of the sensor than the F55. So the F55, that's it on the right there, uh, it's rated at 1250 ISO. Uh, it will record an internal 4K signal to the S by S cards, which is pretty mind-blowing when you think about it. Um, it'll also record HD and 2K. So again, in the front, you can record 4K, not raw, but it's 4K XAVC, we'll talk about it in a minute, to S by S cards, you can record HD, in a couple of flavors of that, XAVC HD, as well as 422 uh, XD Cam HD at 50 megabit. Um, it will record 4K up to 60 frames per second, and it'll do 2K RAW up to 240 frames per second. And another thing that's pretty cool about these cameras is that. Um, they have a really, uh, they've got what's basically called an FZ mount. It's very shallow, it's 18 millimeters, which allows you to use Canon EF lenses, uh, obviously PL lenses, uh, Nikon, uh, and a couple of other varieties. And these are with adapters, aftermarket adapters. I've even got an adapter out there for use with Canon lenses. Um, some of my EF lenses I, I use from time to time. Uh, it's very modular, it builds out into more of a rectangular uh, shape when you put the battery and the lens on. So, you know, it's funny, we all started, and I, I keep going back to, um, well, the F3, for instance. It's, it's like shooting, I mean, I, I gotta be honest with you, without outfitting it um, with, with, a, with a good shoulder pad and grips and everything, it's like shooting with a cinder block. It really can be handheld um, because of the way it's shaped. We're going, uh, as Sony, enlarges their line, they're going in more modular cameras. And basically you can build them out back to that rectangular shape that you can put on the shoulder and balance. Um, it has a shoulder pad too, that's really nice, and, and it connects to the Sony quick release plate. Uh, lots of top and, and bottom mounting holes in the body, so you can, you can basically uh, panavise it, if you will, uh, put more accessories on it. Um, whatever you want to do with it, really, you can do with this camera. And it's just under five pounds, which is great for the aging cinematographers out there like myself. All right. So here is a, a couple lens packages because, you know, I, the thing about Sony is they're, they're not going to usually leave you hanging. They're going to try to come up with all the products that you need to complete your work. And so what they did is they thought, well, we need to come out with some primes, a, a prime set. Uh, there's two sets here. There's the six inch lens set and a three lens set. Uh, I have it, don't quote me, but I have it on very good information that these are rehoused Zeiss uh, compact primes. And if you come and pick them up, I mean, they're really heavy. They're solid pieces of gear. Um, I, and they're very affordable. I mean, I, I think, and Cheryl will certainly correct me, it comes out to like two twenty-five hundred dollars a lens when you when you put it all together. And, and believe me, if you've ever bought a set of Super Speeds or Zeiss Primes or, or Cook Primes or anything like that, that's that's pretty amazing. It's very affordable. I do the MMA show Unrivaled with these primes. It's a sports profile show on on mixed martial arts fighters. It's on Spike TV. It comes on like every two or three months. We've done three. Um, it's not true documentary. There's a lot of repetitive action, you know, they're working out and stuff. But some of it's documentary. We'll go out into their homes, we get to know them. Uh, we, we, we go into, the, like I said, get to know their families. And some of it, you know, you really have to work on the fly. So I'm the guy with the backpack full of primes running around. And because of the way, that this show is, this particular show's may, built, uh, put together, I can pretty much swap, swap my primes, change lenses, uh, and keep going. And the fact that they're at a T2, which is, it's not super speed speed, it's almost there, uh, it allows me to use natural light and dial up the shutter. So uh, if I'm in a dark and dingy gym in, in, um, in um, Siberia, as I was in January, 
I can still get a really nice pleasing image. I can get way past a pleasing image, but I can also dial the shutter up for, for that effect, which is nice for sports. You can't do that if you walk out there with a, with a T4 lens or some, um, something like that. You've got to have some fast lenses to really take advantage, I think, of these, these cameras. Uh, another lens I want to mention, it's not a Sony lens, but it's the Fujinon Cabrio. Uh, 19 to 90 millimeter is their medium zoom now. They have a, a longer zoom, but it's, it's an excellent zoom lens. It has a motor on it, and it's really making its mark in high-end documentary reality. So what am I trying to say? Large imagers are here to stay for documentary and reality. People want that look. So we've basically got a brand new sensor here. I'll give you just a little bit of information about it. Uh, it's a purpose-built 4K video sensor. Unlike some of the other products, uh, maybe in the past, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not a still image sensor. Uh, it's got a global shutter, and it's using S gamut, which is the native color space for all Cine Alta cameras. It's the widest color uh, gamut currently available. It's even larger than print film. So we're talking about uh, the, the 4K uh, RAW, 14 stops of dynamic range. But the camera itself acts, is two modes. It can either act like an HD camera, which is custom mode. It's got all the various gamma curves that you could apply. You're baking in this, this, uh, these looks. You're coming out with a nice HD image. Uh, that uh, like, like a normal HD camera. Or there's a Cine EI mode, which is more like a film camera. It records a raw image, like a negative. I think you've got that. And color and gamma decisions are usually made later in post. Um, uh, raw recording is like a digital negative with greater possibilities for color and, and contrast correction. Um, what else? Of course, the F55 and the F5 are compatible with the ASUS specifications. So again, this is, I just think anytime you can photograph the filament of a light bulb and see other images in the screen, then you're doing something right. Um, okay, the global shutter. This is, li this is a lightning strike. Basically, a lightning strike is, is struck nearby. It's lit up this whole area. With any normal, cam camera, normal CMOS camera without a global shutter, you'd see flash banding. And you've seen that, the black bar. Another issue often is, of course, jello effect. You won't have that with the uh, F55. The uh, F5 does not have a global shutter. And this is as close to a 35 millimeter film camera as we've ever been. Multi-format design. Uh, here are all the formats that these cameras will create for. Um, 4K, uh, like I said, quad full HD or ultra high definition. 2K and, of course, HD at two flavors of HD. Uh, some possible scenarios, you could shoot, record, master, and distribute in 4K. You could shoot, record, and master in 4K, and then distribute in 2K, HD or 2K. Um, and imagine the flexibility. I mean, being able to stabilize your shots, reframe, crop a close-up for HD, keying and compositing capabilities. It's the sky's the limit, really, with this. And then you could also, uh, you know, as I said, future-proof your original as a 4K archival master. So multi-codec design of these cameras. Uh, it's very attractive for people who have ver clients with a variety of needs. Uh, just wanted to list a few shows that are using the F55 now and the F65. Michael J. Fox show, The Blacklist, Camp, Masters of Sex, The Big Bang Theory, Trophy Wife, and Community, among others in development. Okay, this is where it gets pretty cool and about these cameras. You can do simultaneously raw and onboard S by S Pro Plus recording. In other words, you are recording your proxy, um, or at least if, if you can call it a proxy, you can call it whatever you want, um, but it's, it's, it's there at the same time that you're recording raw. The, um, with the R5 4K recorder, you can see it back there, you can do, um, at the same time, you can do HD XAVC 10-bit 422-1920 or XD Cam 8-bit uh, um, XD Cam HD at, four, at 50 megabits a second. Um, some overcranking to come, but you'll probably have to turn the SS off. We're a little unclear on that. There's some new things, some new uh, software updates that are coming. Um, with the R5 and 2K RAW, you can shoot 120 frames per second, 180, 240. Uh, and 240, which is pretty amazing. 
So it's uh, XAVC, is advanced video coding. It's, it uses level 5.2 of the H.264 MPEG-4 AVC. It's the highest level supported by that video standard. It can support 4K resolution um, at up to 60 frames per second, color depths of 8 bits, 10 bits, and 12 bits. And it can do chroma at 420, 422, and 444. Here's some of the tools um, to record raw. You have the AXSM Media and the AXSR5, which is, again, it's a dockable on the back of the F5 or F55, or even the FS700, which we didn't really talk about, but we can um, later. Uh, this uh, five, uh, the AXSM Media is 512 gigabytes, about an hour of HD, um, records XFAT, which is for PC and Mac, and it docks to those cameras, as I mentioned before. So to record two or 4K linear, a 16-bit linear RAW at 2398, 24, 25, 29, 9, 7, 50, and 5994. So you've also got a new file uh, SBIS reader and a, a, a AXSCR1, which reads the, the AXSM media. As you can see that. USB 3.0, but it's, it's, it's back, uh, backwards compatible, of course. XDAVC, uh, I'm just going to go through really quickly here. You can get, a, get an idea of some of the vendors that are, that are behind this right now. Um, this is at 100 megabits per second. Uh, it's intra-frame, which I happen to love. I, I was always very um, resistant to long gop until I was uh, converted. But it's nice to be back to an intra-frame codec. Uh, 4K XAVC. Here's some of the companies that are, are using this, these products. Uh, FYI, La Vida Robot, the George Lopez movie in town, is shooting 4K XAVC to SBIS cards as we speak. Uh, RAW, these are the companies that will work with uh, your RAW stuff for dailies, edit, and grade. And the editorial, it's a little bit of the editorial workflow. And again, when you're shooting simultaneously recording, all this stuff is going to link back to the RAW. It's, it's, it's available to, to basically go back to your RAW for your final finishing. Grading, it's the same situation, basically. You have a lot of larger companies that have, have got behind this, um, and they're using it. New con we're almost done. New content browser, uh, it'll handle the XAVC. It replaces XDCAM browser, and it'll also do 50 megabits 422, uh, and it costs $20. It'll also handle NX Cam too, some codecs. And there's the raw viewer. This is really cool. It's free. Uh, it's a dedicated application for viewing and basic color grading of the Sony raw files. You can apply an ASC color decision list. You can transcode. You can make HD out of your raw. It's, it's fun, and it's free. <laughs> and it's, it's available uh, online. So my last slide is basically just some of the things that asked me to talk about Vegas Pro. I use Vegas, an older version of Vegas, to cut demo reels. Like as I said, I've been out of editorial the last few years. But here's some, some of the new things. Uh, it, it will do multicam editing now. It has a project interchange uh, capability, uh, AAF for Avid, XML for Final Cut Pro, and a 7 and 10. Uh, Adobe Premiere, it'll actually open P uh, project files of After Effects and uh, Premiere files. Uh, broad format support, stereoscopic editing, and 4K support um, for Red One and Red Epic files. And I read this the other day. It's the, it was the first NLE with serious audio tools, uh, such as integrated 5.1 surround mixing. Um, it's, as I understand, it's the only proprietary NLE that allows for multiple instances of the application to be open simultaneously. So you can have one rendering on one, um, in one uh, instance and while you're working on another. So you can have a couple of versions of the software open at once. Uh, that's how to find out a little bit more about me and these products. And I guess it's time for questions. Okay. I, I would like one quick question. Sure. Um, as a cinematographer who's on set and who is, you know, having to meet the demands of people who give them sort of marching orders on We're what crazy. format they want yes. and all those things, yeah. how, is it, how is it working in 4K on set and also having to try to provide some time and some energy to do on set color 
management? And, and how does that, how, is that easy to do? And the other is how much baking in do you actually do when you're, when you're exporting your files out so that do, do, there, there's the onset dailies thing is still a little bit of a mystery to me because I've never mm -hmm. actually done it myself. So, so how involved is that when you're a shooter and you're trying to hit the 4K out, but you're baking in your own looks, but then you want someone has to sit there with a monitor and say, I'm going to use this, this color correction system to very quickly, how, how does all that sort of work? I think people would like to hear that. Well, I, I, I haven't done, to be honest with you, when I shoot with the F55, I've done a lot of uh, 2K and HD with it. When you're shooting raw, you have the opportunity. So think about simultaneously recording. You rec you're shooting raw in the back. You're shooting HD in the front. You basically have the opportunity to use a lookup table. And some of the ones that are mentioned earlier, uh, the P1 through P4 lookup tables and all those are, are available. You end up baking that lookup table into the, into the, the HD image. Right. Does that answer your question? Well, is that, is that, for, is that so that you can provide an onset daily. It's, it's for an onset daily. It's, it's a quick. It's a quick. But you're just recording the raw. But you're recording you're not the baking raw. anything into the raw. You're not okay, baking just anything. It's sure. raw, much like um, as Paul mentioned with his can. It's pure sensor data. Okay. So you're baking in an LUT, a lookup table, yeah. into your HD that you're simultaneously recording into your proxy, if you want to call it that. Yeah. That's good. Does that answer? It, it does. I mean, I, I, I would like to know more about that. That's another topic I think that would be great for next year is to really get into the, the technical aspects of on live capture and then how that signal is broken out so that you can watch it and then how that signal is broken out so you can play with it. Right. But how that relates to where the raw data is going and how that effort isn't wasted on set and that data goes back to the mothership so that when the raw gets there, they have a whole list of what, what everybody agreed to as the best look. Right. That's the stuff that, yeah. <laughs> that blows my mind. It's sort of, yeah. so anyway, I, thanks for your time. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank John. you. Good stuff, man. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.